Imagine you could travel back in time and see the universe when it was just a baby, less than a billion years old. What would you expect to find? A calm and peaceful nursery of stars and galaxies? Or a chaotic and violent playground of cosmic monsters? Well, thanks to the James Webb Space Telescope, we don't have to imagine anymore. We can actually see what the early universe looked like. And what we see is both amazing and puzzling. We see giant black holes all over the place, spinning and swirling in the hearts of young galaxies. These black holes are the ancestors of the supermassive ones that we see today in the centers of most galaxies, including our own Milky Way. But how did they get there so early? How did they grow so big and so fast? And what does this mean for our understanding of galaxy formation and evolution? These are some of the questions that astronomers are trying to answer with the help of JWST, the most powerful and sophisticated telescope ever built. In this video, we will explore this exciting discovery and its implications for cosmology. But first, let's review what we already know about black holes and how they form. In a previous episode, we explained how supermassive black holes and primordial black holes formed in the early universe. If you haven't watched it yet, you can check it out. But for now, let's quickly recap what black holes are and how they form and grow. A black hole is an extremely dense object from which nothing can escape, not even light. It has a point of no return called the event horizon, which marks the boundary between the inside and the outside of the black hole. Anything that crosses the event horizon is doomed to fall into the singularity, which is the center of the black hole where all matter and energy are compressed to a point of infinite density and zero volume. There are different types of black holes, depending on their mass and origin. The smallest ones are called stellar mass black holes, which form when massive stars run out of fuel and collapse under their own gravity. They typically have masses between 5 and 100 times that of our Sun. The largest ones are called supermassive black holes, which have masses between millions and billions of times that of our Sun. They are found in the centers of most galaxies, including our own Milky Way. The origin of these monsters is still a mystery, but one possibility is that they started as smaller black holes that merged with other black holes or swallowed large amounts of gas and stars over time. There is also a third type of black hole, which is intermediate between stellar mass and supermassive ones. These are called intermediate mass black holes, which have masses between hundreds and thousands of times that of our Sun. They are very rare and hard to detect, but some astronomers think they could be the seeds or building blocks of supermassive black holes. So how do black holes grow? Well, according to current theories, they can grow by accreting nearby matter, such as gas, dust, stars, or other black holes. When matter falls into a black hole, it forms a disk around it called an accretion disk. The disk heats up due to friction and emits radiation across the electromagnetic spectrum, from radio waves to X-rays. This radiation can be detected by telescopes like JWST, which can measure the brightness, color, and shape of the disk. By studying these properties, astronomers can estimate the mass, spin, and temperature of the black hole. But there is a limit to how fast a black hole can grow by accretion. This limit is set by the balance between gravity and radiation pressure. Gravity pulls matter inward, while radiation pressure pushes it outward. If the radiation pressure is too strong, it can prevent more matter from falling into the black hole. This is called the Eddington Limit, named after the British astronomer Arthur Eddington, who first proposed it in 1920. So now that we have a basic understanding of what black holes are and how they form and grow, let's see what James Webb has found about them in the early universe that puzzled astronomers. One of James Webb's main goals is to study the first light in the universe, also known as cosmic dawn or reionization. This is the period when the first stars and galaxies formed out of the primordial gas that filled the universe after the Big Bang. This gas was mostly neutral hydrogen atoms that absorbed light rather than emitted it. As a result, the universe was dark and opaque. But as the first stars and galaxies formed, they produced intense ultraviolet radiation that ionized the hydrogen atoms meaning they stripped them of their electrons. This made the gas transparent and allowed light to travel freely across the cosmos. By using James Webb's capabilities, it has been able to observe some of the earliest galaxies in the universe, 
which are about 13 billion light years away. This means we see them as they were when the universe was less than a billion years old. These galaxies appear as tiny red dots in the sky, but Webb can zoom in and reveal their details. And what James Webb has revealed is surprising and puzzling. Many of these galaxies have large black holes at their cores, spinning and swirling in the midst of gas and stars. These black holes are not quite supermassive yet, but they are much bigger than stellar mass ones. They have masses between hundreds of thousands and millions of times that of our Sun. They are also very active and bright, meaning they are accreting a lot of matter and emitting a lot of radiation. These black holes are not what astronomers expected to find in the early universe. They are too big and too numerous for the current models and theories of how galaxies and black holes co-evolve. How did they form so early? How did they grow so fast? And what does this mean for our understanding of galaxy formation and evolution? These questions have puzzled astronomers since they first discovered supermassive black holes in the early universe. These are black holes that have masses between billions and tens of billions of times that of our Sun. They are found in quasars, which are extremely bright and powerful sources of radiation that outshine entire galaxies. Quasars were first detected in the 1960s, but it took decades to realize that they were powered by supermassive black holes. The problem with these supermassive black holes is that they seem to appear too soon in cosmic history. Some of them are as old as 13 billion years, meaning they formed when the universe was less than a billion years old. But how did they get so big so fast? Even if they started as stellar mass black holes and grew by accreting matter at the maximum rate allowed by the Eddington limit, they would not have enough time to reach such enormous sizes. We discussed some of the possible solutions to this problem in previous episodes. One possibility is that these supermassive black holes started as primordial black holes, which are hypothetical black holes that formed in the first moments after the Big Bang due to quantum fluctuations or cosmic inflation. These primordial black holes could have masses between 10 and 1,000 times that of our Sun, giving them a head start in growing into supermassive ones. Another possibility is that these supermassive black holes started as intermediate mass black holes, which formed from the collapse of massive gas clouds or from the mergers of smaller black holes or stars. These intermediate mass black holes could have masses between hundreds and thousands of times that of our Sun, making them easier to grow into supermassive ones. But these possibilities are not without problems either. For example, primordial black holes are very hard to detect and their abundance and distribution in the early universe are uncertain. Intermediate mass black holes are also very rare and hard to detect, and their formation mechanisms are not well understood. This is where James Webb comes in handy. By finding more intermediate mass black holes in the early universe, Webb could provide clues about their origin and evolution. For example, Webb could measure their masses, spins, and temperatures, which could reveal how they formed and grew. Webb could also measure their environments, such as the gas density, metallicity, and radiation field around them, which could affect their growth rate and feedback effects. By studying these intermediate mass black holes, James Webb could help us understand how they became supermassive ones later on. Webb could also help us understand how they influenced their host galaxies and vice versa. For example, JWST could measure how much gas and stars these black holes consumed or ejected from their galaxies, which could affect their star formation history and chemical composition. By doing so, Webb could help us solve one of the biggest mysteries in cosmology, how galaxies and black holes co-evolved in the young cosmos. Thank you for watching this video. We hope you enjoyed learning about this amazing discovery of giant black holes in the early universe and its implications for cosmology. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more videos like this. And if you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. We would love to hear from you. Thank you for watching and see you next time.